Chapter 24, Section 5, Social and Political Impacts. The New Deal was a bold attempt to resolve the worst economic crisis in American history. President Roosevelt wanted to use the vast power of the federal government to end the Depression. But he also wanted to create a more just society. The United States, he said, should become a country in which no one is left out. The New Deal's sweeping reforms aimed in part to meet this social objective. Workers, women, and members of minorities all felt the impact of the New Deal, though some got a better deal than others. A good deal for workers. The New Deal helped many workers by strengthening the labor movement. First, the NIRA and then the Wagner Act guaranteed the right of workers to form unions and to bargain collectively. This change in government policy boosted the power of labor unions. They now stood at a more equal footing with employers. As unions became stronger, they also began to grow. This growth presented a challenge to the American Federation of Labor, AFL, a large and powerful alliance of unions. From its birth in the late 1800s, the AFL had organized skilled workers according to their craft, such as welding or printing. It had left less skilled workers to fend for themselves. During the 1930s, activists within the AFL began demanding that it organize workers not by craft, but by industry. That way, all workers in an industry would belong to the same union. John L. Lewis, head of the United Mine Workers Union, became one of the strongest supporters of this idea. In 1935, Lewis helped form a group within the AFL to organize workers in mass production industries. This group later took the name Congress of Industrial Organization, CIO. The AFL suspended Lewis's group in response to its industry-wide organizing. In 1938, the CIO formed an independent federation. The CIO grew quickly, accepting African-American workers and other laborers shunned by the AFL. It organized unions in the automobile, rubber, and steel industries. The CIO's success, aided by New Deal laws supporting labor, helped swell union membership. Less than 14% of workers belonged to unions in 1935. By 1940, union membership would climb to almost 28% of the total labor force. A mixed deal for women. Women also made some advances during the New Deal. Much of this progress stemmed from the influence of Eleanor Roosevelt. The First Lady played a key role in the FDR administration. Her experience working with the poor gave her insight into the needs of factory workers, tenant farmers, and others hit hard by the Depression. She traveled the country, meeting people, assessing their needs, and reporting back to the president. She pushed him to be more daring in advancing his social agenda. She especially encouraged him to place more women in government positions. Under FDR, the government hired an unprecedented number of women, more than in any previous administration. Talented women, such as Frances Perkins, reached high positions in government for the first time. Perkins, FDR's Secretary of Labor, proved to be an outstanding advisor to the president. The first female member of the cabinet, she worked tirelessly to shape and administer such programs as Social Security and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Another prominent figure, Mary McLeod Bethune, served as a special advisor to the president on minority affairs. She also worked in the National Youth Administration, NYA, where she fought to increase opportunities to, for young African Americans. Not all women fared as well, however. As the Depression deepened, women were pressured to leave the workforce to free up jobs for men with families to support. The Economy Act of 1932 prohibited a husband and a wife from both working for the federal government. State and local government banned the hiring of women whose husband earned a living wage. Other employers simply refused to hire married women at all. Labor unions often supported the exclusion of women from the workforce. The working wife whose husband is employed, argued one union leader, should be barred from industry. A disappointing deal for African Americans. The New Deal offered some hope for black Americans, a group hit especially hard by the Depression. Competition for jobs, along with discrimination and hiring, pushed the unemployment rate for blacks well above that for white Americans. Direct government relief as well as work relief programs, such as the CCC and the WPA, helped many poor African Americans survive. At the same time, more educated African Americans got jobs in government. A lawyer named William Hasty rose from a position as an advisor to the president on race relations to become the first African American to serve as a federal judge. Still, African Americans continued to suffer from oppression. Even New Deal agencies practiced racial segregation, especially in the South. 
FDR himself failed to confront the evil of lynching, which claimed the lives of some 60 blacks between 1930 and 1934. In 1935, a federal anti-lynching bill came before Congress, but FDR declined supporting it for fear of offending powerful Southerners in Congress. Eleanor Roosevelt took a more courageous stand on civil rights. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow a renowned black singer, Marian Anderson, to perform at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. Roosevelt arranged for her to sing outdoors on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. A crowd of 75,000 people, including many members of Congress, attended Anderson's performance. A better deal for American Indians. For American Indians, the New Deal had some positive results. Even before the Depression, many Indians lived in grinding poverty. Federal efforts to assimilate them into the mainstream America had trampled on their cultures and traditions. FDR's Commissioner of Indian Affairs, John Collier, hoped to repair some of the damage with an Indian New Deal. Collier ended the policy of forced assimilation, replacing government-run boarding schools with public schools on reservations. He also encouraged greater cultural awareness about American Indians and improved health care for them. As well, he tried to give Indian tribes more control over policies that affected their lives. Under the terms of the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, Indian communities received the right to set up their own tribal governments. The Indian New Deal did not lift Indians out of poverty or bring back traditional Indian ways, but it did reverse some harmful federal policies and restore some pride and hope to Indian communities. A tough deal for Mexican Americans. Like other ethnic minorities, Mexican Americans faced poverty and unemployment during the Depression. As the economy shrank, jobs dried up in the Southwest, where most Mexican Americans lived. Failing farms and businesses could not afford to hire laborers. The AAA, which paid farmers to cut back on planting, led to even more unemployment among farm workers. Some jobless Mexican Americans resettled in cities, others relied on work relief programs for their survival. Mexican laborers who were not American citizens could not enroll in work relief. More than a third returned to Mexico, many with their American-born children. Most went willingly, but the government deported others. The Emergence of a New Deal Coalition in Politics Although the New Deal failed to bring concrete gains for many women and minorities, for most Americans, its benefits outweighed its shortcomings. The belief that government could make a difference in voters' lives inspired many people to become more involved in politics. When they did, they often supported Democratic candidates. For example, in the 1936 election, over 70% of African American voters cast their ballots for Roosevelt. This marked a major shift for black population, which had traditionally supported Republicans as the party of Lincoln and emancipation. The 1936 election signaled the emergence of a new political partnership known as the New Deal Coalition. Besides women and minority groups, the coalition included industrial workers, farmers, immigrants, reformers, southern whites, and city dwellers. What held these unlikely partners together was their loyalty to the Democratic Party and its leader, Franklin Roosevelt. For all their differences, they trusted FDR when he said, The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little.